Check Podcasts. Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to Chamber Chats, coming to you as always here in the podcasting studios at the Czech Media Group, one of our Chamber Champions. I will begin, as always, by acknowledging that I live and work in the ancestral lands of the Lekwungen speaking nations known to us as Songhees and Esquimalt, or Kosapsum who have been the stewards of this land for thousands of years. And, of course, uh, Chamber Chats is made possible by the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union, who are redefining what banking can do for people, for communities, and for the world. I've mentioned many times on these broadcasts that I'm a foodie. I'm a food guy. I love food. I cook all the time. When I go home after work or after an event or something, I cook. That's how I relax. That's how I chill out. Grocery store trips are a wonderful thing. I love it all the time. Amanda jokes all the time about, oh, which grocery store did you go to today? So I just love grocery stores and I love everything connected with food. We're going to talk about that today uh, because the grocery stores are our neighbors, they're our friends, they're our community supporters. And the ones we're going to speak with today are also family-owned operations centered right here in Greater Victoria. First of all, Daisy Orser, Orser rather, is the co-founder of Root Cellar. Daisy, how are you? I'm fantastic. Bruce. Good. We're going to hear uh, your story again in a second. And Craig Caven is the South Island Operations Manager for Country Grocer, another familiar brand. Craig, how are you? Very well. And yourself? I'm good, thank you. I'm just glad to be talking with both of you. Uh, Daisy, I want to start with you. Everybody knows the Root Cellar name. We know your brand and, and what it stands for. Tell me about you and Adam starting the company up and how did that all happen? Um, we are both from households that, you know, grew and hunted Adam's Hunt, we're hunters and fishermen, a lot of our own food. So the root cellar name came naturally to us is where you catch the locally grown food from your garden or your neighbor or whatever. Um, we were in the industry in the Okanagan and um, we're seeking opportunity to create a more sustainable, socially responsible, locally focused business model. So we researched our, um, we found our customers essentially that would align with our value set. And they were here. So we hauled our family down here. We opened the business 16 years ago. I just mentioned that our, we have a 16-year-old son. He was three months old when we opened the business. Um, and uh, we were tiny. We were half the size of the McKenzie location, and we had eight employees. And now we have two. We were slow to grow. <laughs> <laughs> we focused on growing the McKenzie Corner location. You know, we added departments. We took over the garden center. I know everyone's familiar with the new department a year kind of that we added. Yeah. Um, we added Oxford Corner uh, 2020, peak pandemic, that one opened. Um, and uh, that feels like a lot. So we have two 10,000 square foot markets now, McKenzie Corner and Oxford Corner um, and about 180 staff. So it's been, a, it's been a, it's from one location to two, but it's felt like a lot of growth over 16 years. Yeah, we're going to talk about the Oxford store in a minute. That's in Cook Street Village, by the way. It was the old Oxford Foods store is what it was. Craig, your whole family's involved in this too. Tell me about Country Grocer and how it came to be. Yeah, it came to be, I guess it would be 1984, uh, the year before I was born and came onto the scene. Um, it was my parents, uh, my mom's two sisters, her brother, um, my granddad was involved as well. And uh, we started with our one location uh, in Esquimalt. And a couple of years later, Royal Oak came on board in 1986 or right around there. Um, and from there, kind of the rest is history. We've grown up and down the island we've grown to salt spring we've grown to lake Cowichan. Uh we just uh, finished our acquisition of the 49th group last february so it's been just over a year now we're up to 11 stores um sometimes it's been slow and sometimes it's gone fast in terms of growth um there's three families still involved mainly um there's six of us in the i guess you kind of call it the third generation now that are really running the operations of everything. Um, our parents and dads and moms have kind of stepped back a little bit and uh, it's uh, our show to kind of carry on now and carry the torch from what they've built. Uh, started from very humble beginnings, that's for sure. I actually uh, heard a story from my dad when we were just away on vacation that they uh, bought too much coffee um, the first year they were open and they had to blow it all out to make payroll. So um, we've come a long way since then. So <laughs> Wow. Yeah, the struggle was yeah. real in the beginning, that's for sure. You mentioned yeah. the, for, the 49th group, for those who don't get north of the Malahat very much, was 49th Parallel is the market. Yes, right? 49th Parallel grocery uh, stores, yes. Uh, which is Ladysmith and... Uh, Ladysmith, 
Shimanus, uh, Cedar. Duncan, and Cedar. Cedar, yes. right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Daisy, we were talking before we started recording. Your kids are getting involved in the business now, too, and Craig talks about that dynamic of it, of it being family-owned. But that's that's like a succession plan built right in because your, your kids all work with the company, right? Uh, our oldest two do. Our youngest is in high school still and feverishly committed to sports, so he has no time. Um, but, yeah, the oldest two both work for us. They both dabbled in business school and um, – we honest found it quite boring. Uh, <laughs> nothing, nothing new. Nothing new happens in first year business that they didn't learn at the dinner table. Um, so they asked if they could learn internally instead. So here we are. We have. Um, they're both in leadership development here, and we're just this is their this is their education platform. And so we're finding every opportunity we can to um, sort of develop their entrepreneurial spirit, and then we'll see where it takes them. It's not for us. I mean, if they want to stick around, that's wonderful, but also it's more about enabling them and that ability to thrive as entrepreneurs. If they're not here, that's okay too. Um, we will see. Yeah. So you opened up the Oxford store, uh, as you said, in 2020. When your industry, everybody was making all of these changes to to align with what the pandemic was involved. So grocery stores, of course, remained open, Daisy, as an essential service. But so, what sorts of things did you put in place in your stores, aside from the plexiglass in front of the cashier? What sort of protocols were put in place that are going to stay, that are going to stay in place ongoing? Uh, for us, it was more like efficiencies that we found to solve problems that we came across because we couldn't have X number of employees in behind the deli counter or whatever. So a lot of those efficiencies and tweaks to processes, it's more a lot of really tiny things that I would say are sticking around than the big things that relate. Like, I mean, of course, we're super efficient at cleaning now. Um, <laughs> sure. Everyone knows how. Yeah. And they're all very good at it. Um, <laughs> cleaner than it's ever been. Um, but really, it's, it's um, yeah, it's a whole bunch of very small adjustments that were made that were cumulatively of massive value to our operation. Yeah, the worst of times can bring out the best in us, that's for sure. Craig, what sort of pivots were put in place at Country Grocer that you think are going to stay in place now? Um, I think a lot of it, beyond what Daisy kind of mentioned, there's a lot of small things that you had to obviously do to accommodate uh, what was necessary at that time. But it's being a lot more fluid in um, the companies we work with, the suppliers we work with, uh, the products we bring in. Um, for the longest time, you're going to get fixed on what you have down the aisles, and that's what you get, and that's what shows up, and you kind of stick with what works. And that wasn't also, that wasn't the case very often with what was happening during the pandemic. We had to switch over here to get something different, a different brand, a different this, a different that. Um, from that, a lot of new things came on the shelves, and we kept a lot of those things too, right? They work just as well. People get to like them, maybe a different price point, maybe different availability. Um, so a lot of good things came from that. Um, another great thing came just not that you don't appreciate your staff, but the appreciation of them showing up every day. Um, that was such a huge thing. Um, there's obviously the pandemic pay that everybody kind of promoted and did all that during that time. Um, we just realized the value of our people and uh, paying them that much more. Um, right. We are a food business for sure, but we are in the people business a hundred percent, right. We're almost up to 1200 employees now uh, company wide without these people, we don't work. Right. So it's, we really are in the people business and we sell food as well. So. Yeah. yeah, we all during the pandemic came to know the empty shelves and the limited yeah. quantities that you could buy and take home with you as well. That's when we all became aware of our supply chain. We're going to talk about that next. Chamber Chats today, we're talking about the grocery business and the food that we all consume. Daisy Orser is with us uh, from uh, Root Cellar and Craig Caven is with uh, uh, Country Grocer. Um, so Daisy, the supply chain. So yeah, the pandemic itself, when the production at the production end or the growing end slowed down, caused this an issue with the supply chain. Then the atmospheric river came along that knocked out the Coquihalla and the Malahat and a lot of farmland and livestock and things like that. Um, what's going on to get us back to the pre-pandemic model when it comes to the supply chain? That's a tricky one for me to speak to because we didn't encounter issue with supply chain oh. a little bit with. Um, you know, packaging and things like that that we're obviously importing um but we because of our local focus and our we're very relationship heavy we buy from over 200 um small vendors within british columbia so yes occasionally some people didn't have something but largely largely what our needs were met um there were you know 
the atmospheric river separate from pandemic had a little bit more impact, but it was brief. And again, you just to price point buy it from somewhere else or have a slightly different option, but there was never an empty shelf situation for us. Um, what it really did was endorse sort of the resilience of our buying model for sure. Um, which, you know, we do it for a number of reasons. Being pandemic proof wasn't one of them. No. <laughs> but, uh, but now we know <laughs> that there's safety in numbers, right? When you have that many people that you're buying from. So Craig, supply chain with you, as Daisy mentioned, you're operating on a slightly different scale because of the size of your operation. Um, but has that come back to something near to what it was before the pandemic? And how has that changed your, your whole procurement process? Yeah, it's it's mostly come back. Um, a lot of the bigger companies, they tightened up their lines too. Um, so if something kind of disappeared, they would focus on their main, you know, two or three items that they would be sending out to everybody and they haven't really come back, um, which at the end of the day is fine. Um, it kind of opens up room on our shelves for newer, different products. Um, we try to focus a little more local now as well. Um, in our case, being 11 stores and having to get everything in every store, um, it can be a little harder for some of the smaller local suppliers. Um, not to say we don't reach out and effort to do that more, um, because that is important. Uh, like Daisy said, it's uh, when you're dealing closer to home, it's a lot easier to be flexible with these people, um, a lot easier to have access to that product. Um, of course, we're you know involved with the big guys that everybody knows, um, and we rely on them as well to fill our shelves. Um, the supply, though, has been fairly consistent recently. Um, there hasn't been too many issues, I would say. But who knows where things are going to go? I know we're going to talk about, um, you know, the gas prices or carbon pricing or whatever it may be. And that could continue to affect us in terms of what we get long term and the cost of goods, because we're always looking at the cost of goods. And if something becomes too expensive for us, that means it's too expensive for our customers and consumers. And, and we don't want to pass that burden on too much. What did the pandemic do to people's shopping habits? Craig, I'll stay with you for that. Did, did, did it shift? It must have pivoted a little bit, right? It shifted more to less frequent shops, probably just buying a little bit more. Fewer trips to the store, for sure. The customer count during that time was definitely down a lot. The average order was up. That's definitely bouncing back, though. The uh, customer counts in all our stores continue to grow. But then the shop is just kind of going in the other direction. Um, it's kind of the opposite effect of the pandemic. Um, as things get a little more pricey these days, people come more often. They'll be more specific with what they're shopping for. And they just won't always buy as much per trip, per se. Daisy, we've had some people in retail tell us that people are buying less but spending more. Have you seen any of that? Um, I don't think they're buying less. I think actually they're buying more because they can't afford to go to restaurants right now. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Which also happened in pandemic, right? That's what drove up the basket size. Everyone was cooking at home. Um, and so I think that, I don't think that they're buying less. I think they could be buying more. I think they're being more selective with what they buy. We're still carrying, we've, we've been watching and we, you know, we're, we're a destination market. We're here, be, we're succeeding because we have, we represent all those niche products. We don't want to not have them. Um, we are seeing like, you know, a reduced volume of niche and high end things and a little more increase on things that are on special and staples. Um, but, um, I think that it's offset by the people are eating at home more. So the, the, it's not as, um, drastic as you might imagine. Yeah. So the relationship that we all have with our grocery store partners is one that we rely on them and they rely on us. And that's why we get along so well. And that's why it works as well as it does. I want to talk next about things like recipes and how we can source that. And of course, the price of gas. We'll do that next. On Chamber Chats today, we're speaking about grocery stores, your favorite ones. Some of them are with us right now. Daisy Orser from Root Cellar and Craig Caven is here, and he is the uh, South Island Operations Manager for Country Grocer. Daisy, I picked up one of these in one of your stores. I know you're doing a little survey thing with some people too, but tell me about this stuff, this collateral that's in the stores. That one's actually not super fresh. Um, <laughs> oh, I got it today. <laughs> no, no, so it is. It is. We've, our, our messaging has evolved since then. We still use that. So Farm Fresh, Dirt Cheap, Delicious is sort of a motto that we do stand by. Um, the Farm Fresh is quite obvious. We're working very closely with our suppliers. Those relationships that I spoke to are the core of our business. 
Um, our business is built around produce where all the fresh departments, like I said, we're not really the middle of the grocery store. We're kind of the outside of the grocery store. Um, but we do have a very strong emphasis on produce specifically locally sourced. Um, so that's the farm fresh piece. Dirt cheap is dirt, dirt cheap is about we aren't always the cheapest, but we always we're fighting to have the, the best price available for good quality products. So we're not willing to compromise the quality of products just to drive the price down. There are grades of oranges and apples that we don't feel we want in people's kitchens. <laughs> so there is there is an occasional perception that we're expensive, but it's just because we have a quality threshold that we're not willing to compromise. Um, sometimes that's impacted by you know nutrition density or you know like there's there's a number of factors that we consider. Um, we also are going to bring something in from China that's cheaper and poor quality and just sitting in a truck for or whatever for months and months when we can buy it from our backyard. Um, so the dirt cheap is about prices that are fair and approachable to both our consumer and our farmer, which is often overlooked. And that's a big piece of why we're not importing as much because um, you can imagine what a farmer in China gets paid for that garlic that you buy three for 99 cents, right? Um, so farm fresh, dirt cheap and delicious is obvious. Our vision statement is that we are your destination market for extraordinary food experiences. So that delicious piece is just a reminder for us and everything that we do, the importance of the values of mealtime. And we like to think that people should look forward to grocery shopping, should look forward to mealtime, should be building valuable memories in the kitchen and around the dinner table. So that's a big element that we leave into everything that we do. I get so excited about food shopping. It's just, it's, 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 really, <laughs> it's really something. And Craig, you guys have this publication that you can get in any one of your neighborhood country grocery stores. Tell me about that. Yeah, our friends and family has been around for 10 years now, um, which is kind of surprising, um, <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, but that's just most highlighting team members. Um, it can have recipes from our show Cooking on the Coast, which we have uh, Chef Heidi, who does that on Czech as well. Yep. Um, it's coming up on the third year this year, and they do their 13 episodes and they cook a lot of recipes with products from our stores, right? Highlighting different farms or different suppliers that we have uh, with those products. Um, but back to the magazine, same thing. It's uh, highlighting recipes, team members, community groups that don't often have the money to, you know, provide that mouth that they need. So we have that in our magazine, in our stores. Um, it gets out to everybody. Um, so that's that's basically what it is. It comes out quarterly um, and just highlighting all the good things going on at Country Grocer, our team members, the suppliers and, and all that good stuff. So um, we have a lot of people involved with that and uh, very thankful that's out there as well. Yeah. And uh, Daisy, you have products with your own branding on it. Yes, we do. So we have a number of products, infamously our green sauce, for example, that are house-made products that are just root cellar proprietary items. And then we recently... I think that was a pandemic project also. Hmm. Um, wait a minute. Tried to stay busy. Um, we, yeah, we launched um, a house brand called Common. Um, the slogan is Common Goods. Uh, common Goods, Uncommonly Good. Yeah. So these are not items that we're making in-house. They're co-packed items, but they are um, pantry staples. They are, we, we say that they aren't the star of the show, but the show can't go on without them. They're items that everybody needs. They're on your shelf all the time. They're canned beans, they're spaghetti sauce, they're salsa, um, those items that everyone's buying on the regular. And we've just sourced um, suppliers that meet quite a high quality criterion and um, and then branded it in a fun way so that it's appropriate and worthy of our endorsement. Yeah, RC Common. We can't have this conversation without talking about everything that you guys do to support community, which is a very important thing to both of you. So uh, as family-owned businesses, you understand that it's important to support your friends and your neighbors and your family. So Craig, talk to me about the kind of stuff that you guys do with Country Grocer. Oh, wow. Uh, what don't we do? Um, <laughs> well, we uh, we support lots of big causes and small causes. We uh, support the Cortinal Society. We support the Cycle of Life Tour, Help Fill a Dream, which we've been doing for years, Heart and Stroke, uh, Habitat for Humanity. Um, those are some of the big ones that we uh, offer our support to uh, and therefore our customers as well. Um, Beyond that, we like to do local organizations and all the communities that our stores are in. We like to support the local sports teams, the school groups. Uh, in Esquimalt right now, we're doing a big fundraiser for the Macaulay School Lunch Program, which has been supported 
immensely it's so it's so great to see so i'm sure beyond that one there's going to be more of those um it's it's just such a big focus it's give back where you operate and where you live um i mean i live five minutes from the royal oak store here and we're we're part of these communities um that was one of my goals when i became store manager in cobble hill i didn't say no to any community group that came our way we put a big thing on the wall when we were there and i think there was almost 200 different groups that we supported in that first or second year that i was there um so anything you put back into the community it, it comes back our way too but that's 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 not the point it's it's helping out everybody around us we're in these communities and supporting these communities is uh one of the main drivers of what we do it's it's so important and we're going to stick with it yeah well you are reliably generous as you are daisy tell me about the stuff that uh that the root seller does um to craig's point like there's a lot of little little relationships always happening um things always going up the door our longest standing relationship is that with Rainbow Kitchen, which is a soup kitchen actually in a swine malt that we partnered with, I want to say 13,000 years ago. We've been matching customer donations um, since that time. We've contributed over $100,000 to the Rainbow Kitchen um, in addition to donating uh, perishable product every week. So we have about 1,000 pounds of produce that goes to them weekly uh, to the soup kitchen and um, from both stores. And that is They've been really, really um, able to, they're fantastic. They're a little more grassroots than some of the bigger places and they're very well staffed with volunteers. And so we can send them, you know, a box of mixed produce and they'll just like freeze all the tomatoes till they have enough to make tomato soup um, and, you know, that kind of thing. So their model is fantastic. Um, it works really well with what we're doing and we're diver diverting like literally thousands of pounds of product that would otherwise be in the waste stream into their food rescue stream. So that's pretty exciting. And then we also do um, near each of our locations, we have a community association that we work with. And then we also have after school programs that we contribute um, hundreds of units of fruit per week to after school programs for schools. Um, but yeah, Rainbow Kitchen is dear, dear to my heart. And, and mostly because their values align so closely, like they're here for sustainable food systems. And so are we, we're just different ends of that spectrum. So it's a great collaboration. Yeah, Rainbow Kitchen is a past winner of a Chamber Business Award, in fact. Thank you both for all you do. And thank you for your time today. And thanks for what you do in the community and the great store service you provide to all of us. Craig Caven is the South Island Operations Manager for Country Grocer. Thanks, Craig. Thank you, Bruce. Appreciate it. And Daisy Orser is co-founder of the Root Cellar Stores. Daisy, thanks to you. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm Bruce Williams. We'll see you again for another Chamber Chat.